So the focus for today's lecture is going to be on large scale machine learning. Essentially when we perform gradient descent on uh, the weights of the neural networks let us say. So what kind of considerations that we need to keep in mind uh, be it in terms of communication and let us say you have large I mean abundance of data uh, and there are multiple agents in the network and they have their own private data. So what kind of uh, algorithms can be em employed to ensure uh, a decentralized learning essentially or a distributed learning but at the same time how does how do we sort of elevate uh, the communication bandwidth constraints that we may have eventually let us say when we are trying to uh, even to our neighbors when we are trying to relay certain information about the weights or maybe the gradients right. Uh, if the if the number of parameters in the network are in the order of a few millions or a even nowadays even like with large I mean large language models they are in the order of billions right. So if you are going to be exchanging that many parameters with your neighbors I mean that entails a huge communication bandwidth requirement uh, like for inter agent communication right. And in that case you would want to ensure that I mean if you have a centralized server that is communicating with all the like, like multiple other agents they cannot expect to I mean let us say there are 10 agents so it would be 10 times of that information right. So that is a huge amount of communication bandwidth requirement. So how do we design communication architectures and algorithms around those uh, communication architectures. The underlying algorithm is still being the gradient descent but how do we sort of uh, decentralize it is going to be the focus for today's lecture. And to start with we are briefly going to review what neural networks are and why I mean just to motivate the problem of large scale machine learning and then we would look at the algorithmic aspect of it. So a very brief uh, introduction to neural networks. Let us say you have some input data it can be an image or some other signal right it can be a time series signal or some other features right. So the goal so what do neural networks do? So for, in, for, for some input x what does it do? Let us say we are looking at supervised uh, supervised learning problem right. So we are going to predict some label y right and let us say if it is an image then we are trying to predict maybe the uh, object in that image if it is an image of a cat or a dog or a tiger and so on right. So, so what does a simple feed forward neural network architecture looks like? So you have this input x going in then what do you have? Weights. So there will be some weights also biases. Yeah, so some nonlinear activation, right? So why do we need nonlinear activation? In daring will be redundant, right? Because if there are no nonlinear activation, then you can multiply all the weights together, and then you can represent output as a function of input directly. I mean, you don't need multiple stacks of weights. So the reason we introduce multiple uh, weight stacks is, or these layers is because after each layer we want to add little bit of non-linearity so that you are making this entire model more expressive. Otherwise it would just be a linear model no matter how, how deep you uh, make your neural network right. So, so there is let us say a non-linear activation. So think of these as non-linear activations. And then there will there is an output layer, right? So these are called hidden layers. And then you have an output layer. In, in certain texts, they don't specifically mention uh, biases. So let's say the input here is x, right? And the output of this layer is, let's call it h1. So how is H1 related to X? H1 is yeah, some sigma of Wx plus B right and W what is the size let us say H is in Rn and X and X is in Rn. 
then what is the size of uh, w m cross n right so w would be in m cross n and what about the bias term it's an rm dimensional vector right so how many parameters are there like for just uh, simple uh, this thing yeah m into n plus 1 parameters thus in certain texts you don't see biases coming in and why like in like they will just be talking about weights and not specifically about biases because you can also define a new input x tilde as x n 1 and and then if you multiply this by this new weight vector which is m cross n plus 1 the last entry is like a bias term right so i mean that's why some in certain texts they don't specifically talk talk about biases they will just talk about the weights of the neural network okay so you the idea is you stack these multiple layers together and then there will be an output layer so if it's a classification problem what kind of output uh, uh, layer functions that you can think of softmax right so for the output layer if it's a let's say regression problem so for a given x you would want to predict y a scalar y then the size of the output layer like the output the dimension of the output layer would be just like a whatever input is coming in cross one right uh, so output layer like usually let's say this dimension is the input dimension here h 3 is is an rp so usually of size p cross 1 for regression problems and let us say if you have a k, k fold classification problem. So, if you have k fold classification problem that means there are k possible classes and you are trying to predict the correct class out of those k classes. And then you have p cross k as the size of the output layer right. Okay. P is this particular dimension, the hidden feature, the dimension of the hidden feature that comes to the output layer. Just like this or k cross p is what you want to call it maybe I think that that may have been the confusion. So, so k is like when I talk about this weight matrix right, output is a layer is supposed to be k dimensional in this case if it is a k fold classes. Likewise, you can write it as one cross p. That's confusing, okay? Because for a simple scalar regression problem, you will have just one dimensional output. Now, for this, so the so the values of this particular thing. So, ideally, for an input image, you are going to be uh, predicting the probabilities of different like that a particular image belongs to a particular class, right? So, you are going to be predicting k-fold probabilities. So, probability of it being a cat, it being a dog and so on right. So, let us say there are k such classes, we have k classes and the output you expect the output to be of this form right. So, it will be let us say 0 0.1, 0 0.4, 0, 0.3, maybe 0.1 and so on right. So, that first of all the sum of I mean it is a valid probability vector. So, the sum should be 1 and the correct class is supposed to be the one with I mean or at least the predicted class is supposed to be the one with the largest uh, entry. So, in this case let us say 0.4 okay. But how do you convert this uh, output let us say I mean right now there are if I look at the output layer let us say uh, let us call it h4. So, h4 is simply uh, w times h3 let us say bias I mean we have some assumed bias as well so w times h 3 right which w is k dimensional. So, you get a k dimensional vector, but it need not be a probability vector right. So, you convert this into a valid probability vector using using so how like right now it is just a some mult some matrix vector product of uh, with w and h 3 right. 
So it needs to be converted to a valid probability vector using softmax activation. This H4 or this particular before softmax activation, this particular output or this particular quantity is called logits or logits depending on area. Okay. And you convert these logits into softmax uh, uh, into valid probabilities using softmax activation. So the probability of the ith class would be H4 i. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And this converts it into a valid probability vector. So now summation yi is going to be 1 and that is what you want right you want summation yi is to be equal to 1. So when computing this by the way just an aside thing when computing this softmax activation uh, let us say h4 turns out to be a number uh, maybe 100. Now e raised to something 100 is going to be enormously huge. So how do we compute this like if you want to make it faster this particular calculation. Yeah, but then just see, but maybe there there may be some other entry which which is like 200. So even if you divide it by e raised to the 100, then there will be an entry with. I mean, the, for this particular class, it will be. Uh, no, this not necessarily right. It's W times H3, right? And it can give you a very large positive number as well. From smaller numbers, you, I mean, you're fine. In fact, it's almost going to be zero, right? So you don't care about computing exponential of a large, highly negative numbers. But exponential like something e raised to the something positive number a large positive number that is very difficult to compute especially I mean if it is if number is large enough right. So it is I mean both in terms of storing the number as well as computing it is going to be challenging. So the trick here is like you find the max of h4 i's over all i right and then you basically subtract this from all the logits and then exponentiate it right. So then in that case the largest entry is going to be 1 and everything else is going to be negative right and that is that is easier that is easiest to compute. So this is what is typically done when when actually for I mean in your PyTorch or TensorFlow instead of directly evaluating these exponents uh, or this softmax they first subtract this and then and then basically take the softmax. Okay. And this basically saves a lot in terms of computational effort. Okay. All right. So you can really think of neural network as some function, some nonlinear function that takes an input x and gives an output y, right? So y is a complicated function of x. We will usually denote this by uh, like f subscript theta, where theta can be considered as, as the weights of the neural network, right? So Okay. So why are neural networks so powerful? Yeah, so there is this uh, universal approximation result. Any piecewise continuous function can be approximated arbitrarily close using a uh, four layer neural network with delu activations. So this is by Shabinko there is this famous result. So any piecewise nonlinear function, continuous function can be approximated uh, arbitrarily close. So give me an epsilon. So I will find a four layer neural network with nonlinear active with basically with ReLU activations and number of neurons that are going to be there in each layer, right. So and what do you mean by number of neurons? So when you have an input x coming in, so this 
So you can think of each unit as a neuron here, right? And essentially, it's the strength, it's a connection between this input and this particular uh, this particular neuron, which is the which is represented by this particular weight matrix or this particular element W i j kind of thing, right? So if you have an input i like the x i, so this W i j kind of or W j i represents the strength of the connection between this i this ith input and the jth neuron, right? So how many neurons are going to be there? So that this determines the width of the neural network. How deep the neural network is going to be? Basically, it's related to the number of layers that we are going to have in the neural network. And it turns out, uh, like I mean, so the reason that deep learning is so popular is, like if you want to approximate the same function to the same degree of approximation, like if you want to approximate the same function to the same epsilon value, if you want to design a neural network with wider, with let's say fewer number of layers, then you would need exponentially more neurons, then maybe having fewer neurons per layer, but making it deep. So that's why making the neural networks deep, in fact, you can show is, uh, is useful in terms of the number of parameters that you want to have in your network. So it, it, would, it, it would try to, uh, in some sense, you, you would have fewer number of parameters to work with or, or at least, uh, yeah. And if you, let, let's say, if I try to reduce the number of layers, then I would have to have exponentially many neurons in each, each layer. So that is uh, one of the results. Uh, anyway, so, so the idea is that, I mean, given an input, you are going to be learning a certain output of it. And how do we do that? So if, let's say, I have a bunch of data points, right? I have x i, y i, i ranging from 1 through n, I have n such data points. And I want to learn the, again, I mean, you can think of weights and biases as just the weights, right? I want to learn the weights of neural network. Weights of a neural network. So how do we learn that? How do we train a neural network? Yeah, so you, we need something called a loss function, right? So what kind of loss functions can we work with or like some of the common loss functions that you may be aware of? Cross entropy. Cross entropy. So again, it dip, this question has like, so it depends on the kind of problem, right? Like let's say if it's a regression problem. Yeah, so reg, then a mean square loss would satisf, would make sense. And a mean square loss would be of the form. So you have a you have a prediction for a given sample, let's say xi. You have a prediction yi hat, and you have the true value yi. And this square is going to be the mean square loss, right? Or the squared loss, and then you can take the mean over the data samples, and that gives you the mean square loss. What about classification problems? What kind of loss functions? Do we work within the context of classification problems? Cross entropy loss, right? And what is the functional form of cross entropy loss? Let's say Ti is your target or Yi, like what, whatever. So again, think of like one, so Ti's are going to be one, zero, and so on, right? If it's, it's going to be one, if let's say it belongs to, let's say it's an image of a cat. So if it's a probability vector, it's going to have one only for the cat element, cat true, and everywhere else it's going to be zero, minus ti log pi, right? So that is the cross entropy loss, i ranging from one through k. For a, for a particular sample, this is the cross entropy loss, and then again you take the mean of it, so you get mean cross entropy loss, and so you have a loss function, let's call it L, okay? And loss function depends on what? Your current weights, right? It's a function of the weights of the neural network. And what else does it depend on? Thus, the data points on which you're going to be working with, right? So on which you're trying to optimize. Let's represent this by zeta. So your loss function L depends on the weights as well as the data points that you're going to be optimizing your, uh, or training your neural network on. 
right so if i if i were to uh, write so how do we then train the neural network so we want to minimize this loss function so minimize this loss function so what are the algorithms that we have looked at for minimization problems simple minimization problems what like what is the simplest algorithm that comes to your mind gradient descent right so what was gradient descent so suppose i want to minimize a function f so again just to briefly recap suppose this is what i want minimize this function f of x so what does the ith iteration or kth iteration of this looks like you have xk plus minus xk minus some step size eta k times this is your simple gradient descent algorithm okay what is stochastic gradient descent or sgd as you may have seen what is stochastic gradient descent yeah one point or let's say a few set of points here yeah, small batch of i mean technically yeah so so we are going to be updating the weights of the neural network so wk plus 1 is going to be wk minus step size times gradient of loss function def, uh, defined using the current weights wk and the data points that you are going to be sampling in the kth iteration right theta k okay so very similar to gradient descent but the stochasticity comes from the i mean fact that we are choosing the point and depending on what point we are trying to optim like compute the gradient on we only have a stochastic estimate of the gradient we do not have the full gradient estimate right and therefore it's a it's called stochastic gradient descent algorithm okay so in i mean in theory i mean you would actually i mean the if you look at certain text in particularly in deep learning or machine learning stochastic gradient descent would also correspond to having just one uh, considering one data point at a time and there's another notion called mini batch gradient descent where you consider a few set of points i mean not the entire data set but a few set of points on which you try and optimize this right so what is the advantage or disadvantage of stochastic gradient descent so there's also a full batch gradient descent which is similar to uh, is full batch gradient descent you can also call it simple gradient descent algorithm which is fine and the way this works is wk now here you're going to maybe take the let's say there you have n data points in this in your example in a, so this is simply going to be gradient of okay so you compute this gradient with respect to uh, let me also include wk here so that's also clear okay. okay so this is you compute the average of the gradient of all the like evaluated on all the data points and then you out, uh, update the estimates wk plus 1 so which is better stochastic gradient descent or full batch gradient descent or maybe somewhere in between mini batch gradient descent why so full batch gradient descent is too slow okay because you want to because of gradient computation right
because of gradient computation on all data points. What else? So then why is stochastic gradient descent not good? Okay, so stochastic gradient descent is uh, too stochastic. If you're just computing gradient with respect to one point, on one point, right? So it's going to be too stochastic. So somewhere in between is going to give you a nice sort of, uh, it's, it's going to somewhere in midway. Uh, it's basically, it will try and balance out the two aspects. Is there any, anything else, any other advantage of working with uh, great like full batch gradient descent versus uh, or maybe working with mini batch gradient descent then then a full batch gradient descent something else that you can think of in terms of convergence let's say which one mini batch will converge faster why so then it will converge slowly right Let's say this is this is your, how a loss landscape looks like. First of all, in neural networks, because we introduce nonlinearities, it becomes a non-convex function. Like I mean, the loss function is a non-convex function. In so, is the square thing is square loss a, lo a convex function or non-convex function? It's convex, but when we talk about convexity, we also always talk about convexity with respect to what? It's convex in y i hat, right? But it's not convex in the parameters of your neural network. So it's a nonlinear function of your of the parameters of like this. This particular loss function is a nonlinear function of the parameters of the neural network. So this is while this is convex in y i hat. It's not convex in the parameters of the neural network, and that's why you see the loss landscape to be highly non-convex. That's something that you must have heard of. Same with cross entropy loss. This is also non-convex in the parameters of the neural network, but otherwise, uh, the I mean this is a convex function. So if you have a non-convex landscape like this, right? And if I use a full batch gradient descent, we expect it to be to act smoothly, right? So let's say I start somewhere over here. And if I run a full batch gradient descent, and it will slowly because gradient computations would be good, I mean would be smooth. So it will sort of slowly converge towards this. That's one thing, but it's also so it smoothly converges to the uh, local optimum. When we add stochastic gradient descent, there are going to be a lot of, uh, so let's say I start here, right, and I use stochastic gradient descent. So at this point, I, I took a sample which, which was somewhere over here, like which basically gave me the gradient value over here, here. I'm going to be bouncing around a lot, but because of this randomness, there's a possibility that I may get converged to a better minima. So which is not the case with full, full, with full batch gradient descent, the chances that you converge, like I mean, converge to a very good local minima are also going to be somewhat smaller because your convergence is somewhat smoother. So you are not going to be bouncing around a lot and if you want, I mean the only reason that you can avoid shallow local minima and converge to a better local minima is by basically bouncing around, maybe use a larger step size or keep changing the step size so that you sort of uh, escape that uh, shallow local minima and then converge to uh, a better local minima, right? The chances of this happening with the full batch gradient descent is going to be smaller. With stochastic gradient descent, uh, that's it's possible that you may converge to a, but then there's too much randomness with stochastic gradient descent. So therefore we use a, a middle path where we actually use some set of data points and that is called a mini batch gradient descent. So instead of using just one data point, we use a few set of data points and then compute the gradient so that it's not as jittery as stochastic gradient descent but it's enough to actually avoid shallow local minima and then obviously there's another thing that you don't need the entire batch to be stored and the gradient to be computed. So that's another computational advantage of a mini batch or the stochastic gradient descent over a full batch gradient descent. Is this clear? Yes. 